for our final panel of the day. We're going to have, I expect, a more intimate session. Um, I would encourage those of you who have not yet taken your seats to come as much to the front as possible so that the conversation can truly be intimate and we are not projecting to a, a paucity of folks you're, in the rear. You're required to move. Yes. yes. Um, before we actually get started, um, I'm going to let Vince say a few words. Kick us in. Great. Um, I just wanted to uh, offer a, 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 a few thank yous. Um, before we get to the very end of the day, uh, and there's no one to hear my thank you, so I want to make sure that uh, we take advantage of this right now. Uh, and as Lynn walks into the room, first of all, thank you, Lynn, Church, our operations manager. And right here at the front of the room, Jessica Clark, who's been involved with so many things, particularly the festival, but everything else as well. And Sarah Armour Jones and Dennis Wilson over here, who've been running all the tech. and. Uh, helping to bring it all together for many weeks and months, uh, so we really appreciate that. I think we all have been very well fed by Enrique and Angela, wherever they are out there. Thank you for Federal City Catering. Uh, we can endorse that. Um, and thank you to our hosts here at the Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, David Rousseau, uh, and really everyone who's participated. We, we hope you've enjoyed these conversations and hope you've had a chance uh, throughout the day, not just in this, in this panel discussion, but up until now throughout the day making connections in, in all of the networking time that make it worthwhile for all of you. We're going to ask you uh, candidly if, you, if it was worthwhile to you and we, we encourage you in our surveys, our follow-up surveys to let us know what works, what doesn't uh, and, and how we can improve these events. Every one of them is shaped by the previous reviews so we really encourage you all to, to fill those out and uh, uh, to keep the conversation going that way and also just a reminder that we have mediaimpactfunders.org as a place where you can find out more about the festival that we announced last, last night um, and uh, the database that really all of you should be looking at. Um, if you're seeking funds, it's a great map of who's making grants. And if you're making grants, equally, we want to make sure you see your grants represented accurately. And if, um, if, you, if they're not, we want to know that too. And, uh, and we would encourage you and anyone you know in the grant making area to e-report to the Foundation Center and we're going to share more information about how you can do that, but well, we, we want to definitely uh, encourage that. And with that, I think those are my announcements and thank you, Matt Thompson, our chief um, mischief <laughs> for the, the day that you've presented us with. Thank you. And thanks again, Vince. So we've, uh, we've talked about play today, we've talked about health, we've talked about sound, um, and now we're going to talk about images and pictures um, uh, and how they relate to those things. So uh, for our last panel of the day, we're going to talk about representing identity through documentary photography. Um, how are participatory projects addressing issues of race and social justice and identity and belonging? Um, in new ways and what can those of us who make public media learn from these practices uh, as well as what are funders doing to support this field. Um, back in March, um, the Media Impact funders also looked at documentary film and photography in the public interest uh, including uh, participatory pho photo photography and how pho photography is being incorporated into the work that you all do. Um, and now we want to talk about the broader discussion of film and media uh, and how these things relate to the, our subject of the day of remaking public media. So um, let's dive right into it and hopefully have a good, more intimate conversation uh, uh, as we go. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, Thomas Harris. Um, Thomas Allen Harris, um, who has worked on uh, Through Lens Darkly, and sh will show us a couple of clips today. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, Media Impact Funders, for having me here uh, with my team and my uh, producing partner, Don Perry. Um, so the first thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about this transmedia project that we've been working on for the last 10 years, dare I say. Um, it's uh, a film and an interactive project, and, and that's actually our website, One World, One Family. 
Um, I'll start with the film. The film uh, initially began with Deborah Willis approaching me about doing a, a filmic interpretation of her book about the history of African American photographers. And as I was trying to find a way into that story, um, reflecting on the fact that I came from a family of photographers, I was very much aware that the images I saw in my home were very different than the images I saw of us uh, outside in popular culture. And so I wanted to find out, well, how far back does that go in terms of this re issue of representation and the war of images? And the film evolved into this, this, uh, this film called Through a Lens Darkly, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People. And one of the things we realized was that, you know, the um, African American families have not been part of popular culture representationally because uh, most of the people who took photographs of African American uh, families were black photographers and their archives you know, have been hidden and uh, discarded and ignored. So, um, so I'll show the, the clip. Uh, this is a, a trailer we made for the premiere at Sundance in Berlin and, um, and then go into the Transmedia project. There are secrets in every family. Sometimes they're buried deeply. And sometimes they're right out there in the open, willfully unseen. There is one place where all the secrets reside. In the family photo album. what it chooses to represent, and in what is absent, hidden. As a child at the age of six, I realized that I am black, and I didn't want to be black. Every day we're basically told, you ain't it. You don't look right. The cowards, shiftless, laziness, stupid. Seemingly never-ending barrage of negative representations wield a certain kind of political force, even though they are fictions. How was, is, the photograph used in the battle between two legacies, self-affirmation and negation? Our salvation as a people, as a culture, depends on salving the wounds of this war. A war of images within the American family album. For Family Reunion, which came out of our work with BayVac, um, and it was, a, it was a transmedia project that was initially going to be a mapping project online. And we were uh, immediately, almost immediately after, asked to present the project in Atlanta at the Integrated Media Association, and a roadshow was born. And we started traveling around the country with the roadshow, and we decided to, uh, to name the roadshow Digital Diaspora Family Reunion. Uh, because we were very interested in, although we were interested in, in getting African American images, which normally one would not encounter within uh, mainstream archives, we wanted to open it up and really encourage everyone to bring in their family photographs from, you know, thinking of it from the perspective that we're all related. Um, and we were also interested in creating a movement where people use the family photographs as a tool to educate, to illuminate, um, to, um, to really focus on storytelling and visual literacy, and mo most importantly as well, archiving. So I'm going to show a little, uh, a little clip reel we have from the Roadshow, um, which started about 2009 and, uh, and has continued since then. One world, one family. And you can turn the sound world, up a little bit. This is One World, One Family Team, DDFR. Check them out. So we've traveled to um, uh, Boston, to the Bronx, to Atlanta, D.C. We've worked with various different partners. Our partners have included AFI um, Documentary Festival, uh, Brooklyn College, 
uh, Sundance, when we did the, premiered the film at Sundance, it premiered as a transmedia project uh, using an Instagram campaign with, in which we collected almost 2,000 images from people over the course of four days uh, and had uh, 40,000 likes and about 2 million impressions. Over the course of the last five or six years, we've collected over 8,000 images. Uh, the Roadshow encourages people to not only uh, think about how to archive their projects, their, their family photographs, but also how to uh, the tra traverse the digital divide. 95% of the people that we interviewed did not have a lot of their, did not have any of their family ar archives digitized, um, and young people had very little awareness of the idea of archiving uh, and preserving an image that they took with their cell phone. So we, we actually videotape each of the stories, we upload them to our site, One World, One Family. And the film will be released theatrically starting at the Film Forum in uh, August and uh, nationally. And the goal is to travel with the film and with Digital Diaspora, where people come in front of a live audience and share their family photographs publicly and really transform the audience from an audience of strangers to an audience of family. It's an interactive performative event that involves music, uh, live storytelling, and um, uh, the audience and the presenters are one and the same. We received a Rockefeller New York City Cultural Innovation Fund Award to travel across all five boroughs of New York City and do digital diaspora starting at the Gatehouse, the Harlem Gatehouse. And um, we're going to be working with Rockefeller to do a uh, to create a, a use this as a model to uh, launch it in cities across the country. Uh, this is the, our Instagram uh, campaign from Sundance. And so, um, yeah, one of the things that that we realized also is that uh, in filling in the missing links in the family album was the, um, you know, not only um, African Americans and other minorities, but also LGBT folks. And we actually just came back from Toronto, where we were, as part of the film showing at the Inside Out Festival, we were invited by the LGBT archive to uh, do a digital diaspora there in which we encourage uh, uh, various communities to come in, share their family photographs, and become part of that archive. And so I'm going to uh, stop right now and um, I could talk later uh, if there are any questions. Thanks. So next we are going to hear from Austin Merrill, who is the co-founder of Everyday Africa. Take it away, Austin. Thanks. Um, I, with uh, Peter DeCampo, uh, am the co-founder of Everyday Africa, which is a uh, project that uh, uses images taken on an everyday device and uh, uses an everyday device to take images and show them in a way that we hope um, will help dispel some stereotypes um, uh, of life in Africa. Um, it's our hope that, that through this simple tool we can help dispel stereotypes, we can help to refute some of the misperceptions that are out there about life in Africa that unfortunately are frequently encouraged by media coverage. Um, and what we're trying to show, actually I need that clicker if I could For some reason, it's on the last one instead of the first one. Pardon our dust. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope, that's the last one. Try clicking on next. Ah. Uh, we're trying to show that Africa is more than a place that simply is overwhelmed by starvation and disease or consumed by conflict or blessed by safaris. And thanks to the generous support of the Open Society Foundations and the, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, what was started by two journalists who were frustrated by the ways in which uh, life in Africa was depicted um, has become something that we hope has started to make a little bit of a difference in the ways that, um, in fighting stereotypes and telling stories about that part of the world. We had a conversation with some students in uh, Chicago uh, a few months ago. And we asked them for their impressions of Africa in one word. And here's what they said. 
Now, giraffe. As, <laughs> giraffe, giraffe. As depressing as that was, it was also an indication that, first of all, we were talking to the right group of people. And secondly, it was an indication that we're not making this up, that, that uh, stereotypes uh, of life in Africa are a problem. And it's a problem that, that starts um, at a young age. So Peter and I started Everyday Africa in May of 2012, two years ago. Uh, in that amount of time, we've now, uh, we now have photographs from uh, 20 different photographers. We've covered most of the countries on the continent. Uh, and we have 90,000 followers on, on our Instagram feed. Um, we are not trying to say that bad things don't happen. We're not trying to say that um, corruption and civil wars and refugee crises should not be covered. What we are trying to do is provide a little bit of context and to show that other things are happening in Africa. So what are, what are our pictures trying to say? We're trying to say that people play music in Africa. They go to work. They rollerblade. They get married. They go to school. They think about fashion. They go to sporting events. They make paintings. They go to the beach. They vote in elections. They do laundry. They play polo. They drink coffee. And they have good ideas. <laughs> now this is our attempt to represent the familiar, the mundane, even the everyday in what we hope is a beautiful and interesting way. Uh, these are the stories that publications were not interested in. These are the stories we couldn't get editors to pay attention to. Um, and so we, using Instagram, published them ourselves. And then three unexpected things happened. The first was the media came to us. We were published twice in the New York Times Lens blog. We were published in Bloomberg Business Week, on the New Yorker's Photo Booth blog, in Internazionale in Italy. in Newsweek Japan, and in National Geographic, and lots of other places. A second thing that happened was that our images seemed to uh, have struck a nerve with people. Other people are apparently thinking about these same kinds of things. And conversations have been sparked, um, uh, thanks to our, our, our images, um, that have sort of taken this in directions that we had not foreseen. Now, we decided that we would talk to some, uh, well, actually, let me give you a couple examples first of the conversation. This is an image from our Instagram feed. This is a picture of a child taking a bath in Ghana. And I can't really read that. I don't have it memorized very well. But it says something like, the, there's a commenter who says, it's a beautiful picture, but a sad context. And the, the next responder says, why is it sad? She's bathing organically. She's got clean water to do so. She's outside. She's going to school. Please stop thinking that just because it uh, doesn't look like your life, that it's somehow tragic. This is not coming from us. This is a conversation happening amongst our followers. We've been talking a lot today about measuring things and how do you measure the impact. And here are our followers who are, who, this is a way of measuring that right there, looking at the conversations they're, ha they're having. Here's a picture of a, of a, of a girl in Abidjan, in, in downtown Abidjan and Ivory Coast, reading a book. And one of the comments on the picture was, would you do such a picture of a French girl? What's so astonishing about a girl reading a book in Ivory Coast? Again, we didn't get involved. Another one of our commenters responded. I'm not sure where your outrage comes from. It wasn't presented as an astonishing, as an astonishing thing that she was reading. It's simply a photo of everyday life in Ivory Coast, much like the rest in this series. A similar photo of a French girl would be an interesting, as interesting and equally compelling image. So 99% of the time, we try to stay out of these fights, and we let them have the fights. And it's actually been a, sort of a fascinating thing to, um, to watch. So another way of sort of taking these conversations is that we wanted to create a forum for the Everyday, African, the Everyday Africa community to better experience our photography, to be able to get into our images and uh, experience them in ways that are a bit more profound, and look at 
be able to search by country, be able to search by subject matter, et cetera. And so thanks again to the Pulitzer Center and to Open Society, we created a website, a website that launched the day before yesterday. It's on a Tumblr platform. It's everydayafrica.tumblr.com. And you can search through our images this way. And also as a way of further engaging with these kinds of questions and conversations, we decided to take these, class, these images into the classroom. Um, we've been working with students in the Bronx and in Chicago. And we've been piloting a, a program where we get to talk to the students about Africa, about stereotypes in Africa, and then applying that to their own communities. In the Bronx this past Monday, we wrapped up an eight-week pilot program that was held at the Bronx Documentary Center for seventh and eighth graders. And we teamed up with The LAMP, which is a, a nonprofit in New York that works on media literacy programs, to build a curriculum. And we brought in professional photographers to talk with the kids about storytelling, about the power of photography, and about the dangers of stereotypes. A couple weeks ago, we held an exhibit for the students' work, giving them a chance to show off their images to their friends and family, and allowing them to draw some pride from, from this moment and to demonstrate some of the things that they had learned. And so what we found in these eight classes that we had in the Bronx is that what started as a study of everyday Africa became everyday Bronx. And this is something that we're hoping to replicate elsewhere. In Chicago, those kids that had given us those one-word impressions of Africa, they had a few sessions about everyday Africa and about the images and stereotypes. And here's what they had to say two weeks later. Growth, healthy, unexpected, parallel, community, etc. Again, measuring, trying to find ways to measure what they're learning from this process. So these pilot programs are just beginning, and we're very much hoping to spread them around. Sustainability, once again, I've heard that word once or twice today. Um, the third unexpected thing that happened was that this has become something of a movement. So what began as Everyday Africa is now Everyday Bronx, and Everyday Eastern Europe, Asia, Middle East, Jamaica, Mexico, Rio, and a lot of other places. Just yesterday, long after I'd already turned the slideshow in, I had discovered Everyday Iran, which is a fabulous one. And most of these are people that we know, but a lot of them are not, and have just been inspired by Everyday Africa to go on and, and do this on their own. Now, what's next? Well, we want to expand our educational offerings. We're seeking nonprofit status ourselves to try to uh, explore that. We're excited about expanding in some other ways as well. Um, so stay tuned. Thank you very much, Austin. Um, and so Amy, Amy Yenkin, um, is the director of uh, the Open Society Foundation's Documentary Photography Project. So tell us how you approach this from a funder perspective. So I'm going to show you two projects that I think touch on very similar themes to what Thomas and, and um, Austin talked about, and just in terms of their participatory nature, trying to challenge kind of a dominant narrative. Um, in uh, public media and uh, portrayals, and also in the kind of participatory collaborative way, and unique way that they distribute their work. I'll just say a couple words about the foundation. We're a very large global philanthropy. Documentary photography is but one thing that we do. Um, it's our interest in supporting photography is not supporting photography for photography's sake, but because the foundation is so advocacy oriented, it's the role that photography can play in social change. We've supported over 300 photographers uh, directly or indirectly over the last 15 or so years. And the slide you see up here is just um, one example of a project um, that we support, which is an exhibition. Um, so um, the first project I want to talk about, oops, what's going on with my mic? Am I too close to it? Um, the first project I want to talk about deals with the Pine Ridge Reservation and the Lakota people and the depictions of Native people throughout history. So um, this actually is um, kind of a play on uh, the idea of um, uh, outsiders really being <laughs> the ones to document the Native community. And this was a drawing done by Dwayne Wilcox, who's a Lakota and who was a collaborator on a project with John Willis, who's a photographer that we've been supporting, who's been working there for 21 years. Um, John is acutely aware of his outsider status. He's actually, he's quite sensitive to it. Um, 
and of the sort of demeaning um, way that photography has been used against Native people um, over history and or the uh, kind of the reductive nature that it's uh, played in terms of uh, just creating stereotypes about uh, practices, values, traditions. Um, a little bit about, this is a picture of Mount Rushmore that John took, and just to kind of set the stage, the Pine Ridge, this is, in, this is actually, this is in uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota, but the, uh, the, the uh, Oglala Lakota people, their territory once stretched to this, uh, this uh, part of the country, all the way through Minnesota to the Black Hills of South Dakota to eastern Wyoming. Um, photography, um, as John says, has had a very, um, uh, Native people, as I've said, have had a very uh, uh, negative relationship with photography. In the late 19th and early 20th century, photography was used against the Lakota people to outlaw many of their um, uh, rituals and traditions. So although they're legal now, it's a very fraught relationship with photography. And it's with this idea that John, for the last 21 years, have, has approached his work. Um, Pine Ridge today has some of the poorest counties in the United States. Uh, the per capita income is about $4,000. There's low life expectancy, high rates of infant mortality, suicide, diabetes, alcoholism, and unemployment. And a lot of depictions in media, and I'm not going to show these images, but a lot of depictions in media and photography has shown this part of the life of of Pine Ridge. But that's not what John wants to do. John is trying to show something different. And what he says is, how do statistics tell us, what, how much can statistics tell us about life on the reservation? There is immense beauty, openness, and warmth. So this is just one picture of it. Um, and it's, it's a huge and a vast project. So I, I'm only showing you just a little bit of it today. Um, John has been accepted in the community because of his long-term commitment and his engagement, but he's been insistent throughout that he not be the only voice. He wants to, he, he, in, in all of what he does, whether it's in exhibitions or books or presentations, everything he does, he wants to bring in the vo voices of the community. That's to him is a, a critically important component of his work. So whether it's through arch archival images like this or poetry or the elders' voices, historical documents, music, the drawings that I showed first. And um, as I said, this is, it doesn't, what I'm showing here really doesn't do justice to 21 years worth of work. Um, his latest endeavor, which we're supporting, is actually an effort to encourage youth to be documenting their own lives, but also to preserving their own histories and traditions and storytelling. So I was actually encouraged today to see the little clip of the game that was about preserving stories that were a 1,000 years old. It kind of gave me hope about that. And I was also happy to see that it was involving the communities themselves. So this is a picture. This project that John's working on right now is just started. And it's involving the community. And it involves youth-led youth, uh, photography. So in that way, it's very similar to to what uh, Austin's project is doing in the Bronx. Um, the second project I'm going to show you has to do with um, uh, men in solitary, long-term solitary confinement, another population that's sort of demonized in um, media and in portrayals. So this is a project that an activist and artist, Lori Jo Reynolds, started. Um, she became connected with a campaign to close a uh, uh, a maximum security prison in Illinois called TAMS. Some of you might know this project. It's like the other projects that have been discussed here. It's participatory. It's collaborative. The people who are most affected have some voice in bringing their stories forward. It's changing a dominant narrative. It's getting people to think about people in a way that they didn't always, they weren't necessarily thinking about them. Um, so again, it began as a campaign to close TAMS. It's this facility. Um, house people for uh, 23 hours a day for months and years at a time. It's a documented form of torture. Um, there were many components to the campaign. One of them was a project that was called Photo Request from Solitary. So the men who were in solitary there could request an image. 
and then Lori Jo found photographers to take the images, and then the images were returned to the men. Um, in this case, that was a request from Willie Sterling III, who requested a picture of a vigil at the Bald Knob Cross on the top of a hill in southern Illinois. There were many, many uh, images that were collected, and these images, together with the request, became part of a visual element of the campaign. Um, with our funding, uh, the project moved to New York, where a pop-up campaign office was opened last September for a couple weeks. And it was lined on the inside with these requests and the letters and the photos. The outside, you can see the outline of the size of the cell and the little circle that you see in the corner. That would be the toilet. And in two weeks, they collected 2,800 signatures, which were delivered to the State Commissioner for Corrections. People were really moved by this. This is these, these, the, the, both the requests themselves and the images served to um, change the, the idea that somehow these people were, the, quote, the worst of the worst. They really humanized them. And they, the people who saw this really wanted a path towards action. So just very quickly, the result of all of this was in the TAMS case in Illinois, actually, the, um, the facility was closed in 2013. It was a very long campaign. The photos were one ele humanizing element of it. And in New York, more recently, actually, policies around solitary confinement have changed. So I'm just going to leave you. I hate to see my sign. It says I have one minute left. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with just kind of a closing thought. For us as supporters of photography, we see it sort of as an ecosystem. And in that ecosystem, we have the photojournalists and the documentary photographers who are doing long-term work. And that is and that's sing, from a single authored perspective, and that's still really critically important in the ecosystem and valuable to us. But we also value work that really broadens our understanding of situations, of communities, by bringing those people and their voices into it. And there's really been sort of a democratization in, in, in photography and a level of innovation that has allowed that to happen more naturally. With that, I'll leave it. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, so I will weave my questions into your questions, but I want to start with um, what you all are most uh, curious about from what you've just seen. Just saw, seen a lot of powerful images, so I'll start with you. I'm happy to jump in if no one has any questions. Jessica has one over here. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about what photography brings to the table so these other more factual how the impact might be different. Well, I, I could start. Um, I mean, I think that photography, I mean, the, the, there's the, the adage, you know, a photograph is worth a thousand words. I mean, I think that it triggers not only um, a, an emotional response, but also a kind of memory and uh, all the images like it, uh, which is why I think stereotypes are so um, very virulent um, and um, so I, 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 it's um, how one can actually shift the narrative around photography is, is something that you know I mean it, it's it you know it's, it's daunting against you know the, the you know like years of, of you know let's say like colonialism for instance you know whether it's on, a, on the coast on a, in Africa or in the United States um, because we're so you know, we consume these as, as, as facts. Um, and I also just want to s just say that um, with uh, Digital Diaspora, one of our first funders is actually in the room, Sheila Letty, with, with the um, Fledgling Fund. And they actually helped us begin Digital Diaspora so that we were able to have, um, you know, begin to collect images, but also inspire people to think about their images, the images, their private images in their homes as having a connection to the public record, which is what most people don't have. Um, you know, for uh, just one quick, one last example, uh, we did an engagement at Brooklyn College, and a young man who was a father of two had just uh, inherited two boxes of images from his great aunt who'd passed away. And he said, I wish you guys had come here two months ago because I threw those out. I didn't have space for them. So he didn't have the sense of value. He now, now you know, in, in another class, you know, if, uh, you know, if he was, you know, wealthy or you know, if he was, you know, royalty, he would know that, you know, somehow that this this had a lineage, you know. And just because he doesn't have that, you know, doesn't mean that it doesn't have a tremendous amount of, you know, social educational value. Yeah. So those are incredible. All three of those are 
Incredible. So the question I have is, how do you get the word out? How do, how do you let people know that this exists outside of social media and you know, your own hand-to-hand -hand abilities? Do you have any marketing abilities to promote these things? So I'll, I'll start, but I would, I'm sure we have different perspectives on it. This is a, a field that's it's quite underfunded. So some of the big campaigns that you see behind other large projects, that this just doesn't exist. So from our perspective, knowing that the projects themselves are pretty small and modestly funded, and that there aren't, there isn't going to be, there's not going to be a lot of other funding behind it. For us, we're really focused on targeted audiences. We're not looking necessarily for the very big mainstream audience because, well, as a foundation we're, that's interested in social change, what we're looking for is change on a specific issue. So, for example, in the case of the TAMS campaign, you know that they were looking to bring this to the attention of specific policymakers. So, while I, you know. Well, I'm sure that the photographers I work with would love to have a broader mainstream audience, and they do use social media, and they, you know, they're, you know, a lot of photographers are using Instagram, which has been quite, besides what at Lost is suggesting, has been quite successful, and there's a lot. It's just a, there's a there's a huge volume of images out there, so it's very hard to get attention on specific projects and specific images. So for us, it's a it's a very focused effort. I'd say that in some ways the. Um you know, the medium is also the marketing tool, you know, especially with Instagram. You know, we've got 90,000 followers and we get surges when we have something published or when Instagram features us or whatever. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be featured on the proof blog for National Geographic, so I expect a surge tomorrow. Um, you know, it's a, it's a problem. It's, it's very difficult to get people's attention. What we've found, and this kind of gets into the first question that was asked also, what we've found is that um, with everyone's, the, the squeeze on everyone's time, Photography has been a very good way of sort of grabbing your attention quickly. And so, um, you know, writing, we're trying to find ways to bring in writing programs. I love the gaming stuff from this morning. I love the radio stuff you talked about earlier. Um, but for, for this, you know, using Instagram itself, 90,000 followers, they tell two friends, they tell two friends, and it sort of just mushrooms out of nowhere. You know, I, I started as a print reporter. I was with the Associated Press in West Africa for two years. And the amount of time I was, felt like I was beating my head against a wall, trying to get someone to pay attention to these stories, it was enormously frustrating. And so to find this, which started on a reporting trip funded by the Pulitzer Center, um, reporting on the stuff that we were there to report, but then taking these pictures on the, sort of on the side and starting to post them and watching that sort of overwhelm everything else and being the thing that people paid attention to, it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting lesson. Hi, um, Juliet uh, Feeney Timsett from the After Fact Foundation. I just, you touched on something, I mean, this is going to be kind of a basic statement that I'm making, but you touched on something, um, Austin, about um, you're having a hard time getting people to publish these pictures and these stories. And because I think there's just a lot of negative <laughs> news out there, and that's why it's just, there's just, People are not used to seeing articles about happiness. And, you know, there are some more magazines coming out, like Ode and things like that. But I think there's just a, just a whole glut of really negative, negative news out there. And, you know, I think maybe as funders, we should try to, you know, working with a lot of, um, you know, investigative journalists and, and a lot of, you know, groups that, do news maybe make news is that we should maybe focus on trying to sometimes once in a while <laughs> highlighting the happy or the the positive story. Um, I th I mean there's no doubt about it, and that's why I said earlier I'm not trying to say that these bad things aren't happening. And I and I I guess I'd say that we're also not trying to say that it's all happy. You know, it's not all safari. No, it's not all it's happy, more, but it's it, the important thing I think is providing some context. I think the problem is frequently in this part of the world. When you see another bad story come out of Africa, the thought is that, well, that's what it's always like there. So why is it so much worse than what they normally experience? Yeah. And that's just not true. The truth is, is that their lives day to day are very much like the images that I showed, very much like what our lives are like here. So if you can get something out of our project, then maybe you'll know that next time uh, there's 
a famine outbreak or next time there is a coup d'etat that leads, leads to a civil war, that has really disrupted the very normal lives of millions of people. I think that's the important thing, trying to provide that, that context. And if you want to fund that, that's great. <laughs> well, no, th and the reason I'm saying this is I live in Europe and I actually live in France and the media over the last two weeks has gotten a lot of flack because a lot of people are saying that because of the demonization of the um, the Front National, which is the leftist party, it got elected. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot of questioning about how the media handles uh, issues. And um, the French are, you know, I think they have this sort of innate depressive <laughs> uh, uh, personality. But still, the, the vote, you know, a lot of people are saying the vote was just a depressed vote. I mean, people have been, there's such a glut of negative and negative stories and negative you know, uh, images and, 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 and the media is partly responsible that in France for the last two weeks, there's been a lot of, you know, question to the media about how they've portrayed a lot of issues. So um, it's just, just a general comment about the responsibilities today and how, you know, how we can actually, uh, you know, cause maybe, I mean, I'm not saying that the people voted because they, they were so influenced, but it has a lot of bearing. It's, it's a huge issue. You know, I, I joined the Peace Corps in Ivory Coast, and I, I moved to Africa for the first time in January of 1995. And I spent all of 1994 basically thinking about that and thinking and filling out my application and all of that stuff. What are the two big things that happened in Africa in 1994? A lot of big things happened. But the two biggest things that happened were Nelson Mandela becoming president of South Africa and a genocide in Rwanda. And I knew nothing about the continent other than, you know, what I saw in the news every day leading up to joining the Peace Corps. So I was moving to a small village in Northern Ivory Coast with this, these two extremes in my head, the most joyous thing you could imagine and the most horrible thing you could imagine, and learned very fast that life there was nothing like either of those things. It was a lot more just kind of normal. So, you know, really tragic, really joyous. You know, the extremes are, I know that's what makes it in the news. You don't need the context as much here in the States, although you do in places like the south, south side of Chicago or the Bronx. Images can uh, pro promote and provoke empathy, as I think you all have all shown in your, in your presentations. Um, they can also inhibit empathy. Um, there's, as we're preparing to launch a global health and development team at NPR, one of the things that we're dealing with is when you hear the words global health, um, for many people in the US, the image that's still evoked is Sally Struthers um, flies on Ethiopian children during famine in the 80s. Um, that's still our picture of what health looks like elsewhere in the world, uh, despite the fact that the health conditions in some of the poorest corners of the world resemble the health conditions in some of the poorest parts of London 200 years ago. We bring a so sociological imagination to those stories. Or that to we the United don't. States as well. To yes. the United States, absolutely. Exactly. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you go about choosing images that foster empathy and understanding rather than inhibiting it. I was just going to say, I think that a lot of people believe that somehow shock photography still works and it's not just in, like, in, in the public health realm or in the human rights realm, it's also in a lot of war photography that we see that this is somehow, this is what sells and I, I personally, yeah. I mean, from our perspective, I, I, I don't want to support any photography that re-victimizes people and that, you know, oversimplifies the situation. So, um, that's not the kind of photography that we're going to be supporting. I think that it's, we want to support photography. There's images that actually empower people, that may give people agency. Um, I've only shown you a little bit of it here, but it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's trying to depict what the situation is, but also show that some, the people who are the subjects have been treated in a respectful way and have some agency in their own situation, and they're not just victims. Yeah, I, I would also add that, I mean, I think it's so important that we, you know, visually talk about the, our shared humanity. And I think that's what get, gets left out of the sensational kinds of images that, 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 that might uh, be the most triggering, you know, to us to, you know, pick up a paper or whatever. Um, and and uh, the, 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 the human aspect of these images and the commonalities are, is something that is constantly downplayed. You know, when I, I was speaking with another panelist right before she left, uh, um, Laura Frank, I started telling her about digital diaspora, and she says, I have a photograph. 
And this is a woman who's from Rocky Mountain. I think you, you were there, Austin. Um, and she's, you know, ostensibly a, a, a white woman. She scrolls back and takes a picture of her great grandma that she got, you know, a, just a week ago, who happens to look like an African American. She's classified as mulatto. And so she was like, "Well, this is this is this is what digital diaspora is. You know, it's the, there's a way in which." Um, the images and identity can be used to separate, but, the, the, but there are also other ways that we can use these tools to talk about what, what our shared humanity is. You know, I think that, and I, my, my issue, you know, in terms of the digital space is that sometimes it could, it could serve to um, or, uh, isolate and re-isolate. So I, I'm, I'm actually doing a digital project, but also it's really important to have this live interactive project where people get a chance to share who they are and their stories, you know, kind of, um, our, we, we call our um, digital diaspora a cross between Antiques Roadshow and StoryCorps, yeah. you know, and, and to say that, like, mm -hmm. you know, these things are valuable, you know, just because, and they, they, the, the value of having supper together the value of having, you know, a picture of a, a, a you know, uh, a mother and a son, you know, and um, the preciousness of that, of that, that moment in time. I think um, your project is interesting, Thomas. Um, I think self-representation, allowing people to tell their own stories visually, finding, finding the stories that people are telling about themselves visually is one tool to promote to promote empathy. It can also be quite challenging. I know that a lot of, um, some of the most popular images here in the US of black Americans are promoted through the website worldstarhiphop.com. I don't know how many of you all are familiar with worldstarhiphop.com, but it's a lot of videos. Um, very powerful, very affecting videos taken on cell phone cameras of uh, most of the time black people beating each other up in public. Um, um, it's, it's hard to watch, um, but it's self-representation of a kind. Um, how, do you, how do you think about asking people to represent themselves and tell their own stories visually and the challenges? Well, this goes back to the gentleman's uh, um, commentary about marketing. You know, I think that when I was making this film, which is going to be broadcast nationally on PBS, so millions of people are going to watch it, um, there's going to be a huge press behind it, and Digital Diaspora has already gotten a lot of, uh, lot of press and uh, momentum, but I was thinking, I'm making this film for primarily African American audiences, because we don't have access to the value of who we are. You know, because most of the time we're seeing ourselves ref ref reflected or refracted through a dominant lens that is not simply a lens that's right here, but also has this historical weight that we carry. And so W.E.B. Du Bois talks about the double consciousness. And so I think that, you know, people, you know, when I taught at UCSD, I'd give a camera to uh, a young person. The first thing they would do is they'd make an, a, 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 a film that was uh, replicating or the, the latest thing they saw in the, in the movie theater you know, kind of a cheap replication of it, as opposed to in any way accessing their story or what their story could be. And so for me, it's really important that we have a sense through the images of what, you know, to, to trigger our imagination of what these stories could be and offer a possibility for the world that we can create. Amy, you spoke about the Lakota um, mm -hmm. and the relationship that John developed with um, the, the cultures that he was working with. Um, tell me a little bit about the, what he had to overcome in that and what the history there was, what that context was. Well, I, I can't speak for him in terms of what he had to overcome inside the community. I know from talking to him, though, he had to overcome a lot personally. He still, after 21 years, carried a lot of the weight of what photography did to these people's ancestors and to their culture and to their history, and he was so so sensitive to it that he wouldn't even publish his book until he was assured that all the other voices were brought into it. So for him, I think he still feels, he still bears a lot of weight um, for uh, the role of documentarians in the, in the history of the depiction of those people, of, the tr of that tribe. And um, so he approaches Everything he does in the community then is from that point of deep sensitivity. And I think that that's part of what enabled him to build these relationships. He also has devoted a huge amount of time. And there are other photographers who've devoted a lot of time there or in other places. But there are also a lot of people who come and go. And, you know, 
anybody, anybody who's supporting film or photography knows that those kinds of relationships are very damaging for the other people who are trying to build long relationships. Um, uh, you know, it's also, it's, it's, it's a complicated place, so it's not that he has universal, you know, good relationships with an entire tribe of people, you know, but he, he, he also built a very strong connection with a family and with local leaders and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long process, um, but it's understanding what his role was there and what, versus what their role was. More questions? Over here? I'll, I'll grab you. Thank you. Um, I, I like that answer, uh, Amy, and I wanted to, if you know, all of you could kind of talk a little bit to that weight, that burden of outsidership in the making of images. Uh, oh, I'm Don Perry, and I'm one of the uh, producers on the, on the film. Uh, but I'm, I'm really concerned about uh, the issue of, of the outsider status in the making of images versus insider making of images and having people from those two different perspectives to see the same thing but come away with something different. Mm. So I, I, wanna, I wanna really kind of tease out this issue of the weight, the, the burden of outsider in making, uh, in making images and how that's impacted both the kinds of images that you, you fund, the kinds of images that go up on the website, and the kinds of images that are part of the project. I was just going to say very quickly, I think there are different kinds of outsiders, and there's outsiders who really just kind of parachute in, and then there are people who actually take time to get to know people and to really understand situations and context and aren't looking for the quick story, and these are long-term projects, and this is what photographers and filmmakers do, you know, and journal really good journalists do. They take a lot of time, so they could be an outsider, and they have, they have their perspective. And it's not to say that there's something that's wrong. There's, there's not something wrong with their perspective. It's just it's different, and it's understanding that they, they have a different perspective. I see that there's a value in the both perspectives. So you know, I, you know, I, um, so I, I wouldn't. I don't really. Uh, to me, it's not a kind of an either or. It's more that they both have something to say about a situation, and it's understanding that they bring those two different perspectives to it, and that is what enriches it for us as the viewer. Um, but, you know, so I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not suggesting that there's something inherently wrong with the outsider, because most of the work that I support are the people who are from the outside. That's, you know, a lot of people who are really well resourced to do this kind of work, mm -hmm. despite what I said about there being no resources. But, you know, they're more, they're, they have uh, comparative advantages to be able to do this kind of work. But it really depends on their, their approach to it. Look, I'm obviously an outsider in Africa. <laughs> um, most of the people, all of the photographers that participate in this project are people who have spent a lot of time there. I lived in Ivory Coast for four years. I was two years as a Peace Corps volunteer. I was two years with the AP. I've been back numerous times since then. I've covered stories all over Western, Central, and Southern Africa. Um, and all of the photographers that participate in the project have spent that kind of time there. My co-founder also was a Peace Corps volunteer in Ghana and has lived there substantially. He's there now. Um, we also have photographers who are African, who live there, and they contribute photographs as well. Eventually, we want to um, increase the number of African photographers and increase that participation. But one anecdote to speak to this uh, issue, question, it's something that comes up, not surprisingly, quite often. Um, Halan Habila is a Nigerian author, and his best known novel is called Oil and Water. Um, I approached him about a year ago and asked if he would be interested in curating a week of photography on our feed. And he was very interested in the idea, but he said, look, I don't know anything about photography. It's not my field at all. And I said, that doesn't matter. What we're interested in is, is someone who is, a, who is a, an important cultural voice in Africa, in this case in Nigeria, um, and what you have to say about the images that we're producing. And so we had four photographers in Nigeria for a month. And two of them were Western women, and two were African men, were Nigerian men. And they turned in 150 images, and we gave them all to Halan. And he curated a week's worth of images from that feed. And we, so each image had the, the, the byline and the regular caption information, and then also had some info, an anecdote, a story, something from Halan. And one of the things that he told me, uh, which I thought was interesting at the end of this process, was that 
he expected to be able to tell a difference between the photographs that came from the Nigerians and those that came from the uh, Americans. And he couldn't. If he'd just thrown them all into a bucket together, he would not have been able to distinguish one from the other. So to me, that was some indication that we have done, hopefully, a good job of selecting people who have spent a substantial amount of time in that part of the world and, um, and are sympathetic with what we're trying to do. Yeah, I would add that um, I think it's not an issue of outsider versus insider because we're all kind of outsiders. I, I mean, I think that because I've received the kind of funding that I've gotten as an African American filmmaker, it makes me outside, very, very, very much an outsider, you know, in terms of uh, black filmmaking um, community. Um, uh, but I think that um, the question is resources, you know, whether, how, to, to what extent um, the, um, the people who quote, quote unquote the insiders uh, you know, inside the community have access to certain resources and um, to be able to tell their story because I think that that is very critical. Um, you know, right now uh, the what we all know as a family album is is something that's soon going to be only only exclusively in museums in 20 years. You know, and and people are recognizing that those things are things that have been curated. And uh, they've been curated by you know people who you know who know those images and knew those people at some point or or had been or they were their ancestors and so and and how and they're being auctioned off as well and so the idea of being able to tell one's story and craft one's story is is so important I can't you know underestimate or, or, or underemphasize the the importance and the power of that um, you know in terms of diversity. Um, so for me, it's not a question of either or, but it's a question of how do we allocate resources to allow communities to to be empowered to tell their own stories um, over you know over over time. I would also I would add just that um, who's telling the story is part of the equation, but who's the story being told for and to mm. is another part of the equation. Um, for um, NPR's race, ethnicity, and culture team is called Code Switch, and one of the part of the ethos of the team um, is that you know it's six journalists on the team. It's impossible, it, and we, they report on race, ethnicity, and culture from a multicultural perspective. It's impossible for the team to have represented within it all of the perspectives, all the cultural and ethnic perspectives that they'll be covering. Um, but there's a way of framing the reporting. Who are you reporting for? We say, as an ethic of the team, we are never reporting on anyone, on any community or any individual, as though they are behind museum glass, that we're telling their story for others to sort of gawk at them. Um, we want to make sh every story as interesting to the people at the center of that story as they are to the, those who are listening to it. Um, it's a challenge to do that, but the challenge makes the stories better for everyone, I think. Um, so probably one or two more questions. Um, and one thing I'm, I'm actually curious about, um, Alan, I think uh, the work that you did uh, with the Cook Inlet Tribal Council um, uh, reflects some of these same tensions. And I'm curious what, what thoughts or resonances you've heard in this conversation. Um, I'm just processing it all and, and thinking about the difference between photography and interactive games just as a medium. I mean, certainly everything you said resonated with us. I mean, we spent years building trust. And the trust really went both ways. What I think is hopefully making that project work is not only did the game makers who knew they were outsiders take the time to really build the trust, our indigenous partners, and there were many different partners with many different perspectives, really took the time to, to, to learn the crazy community of video games. Because that is a weird culture. That is its own culture. And a lot of that fascination and fondness that was built in is the building blocks which the relationship is built on. But when I look at this, it's actually less almost that side of our business. I, I was fascinated, I think, by the programs you were running in the South Bronx where kids, I mean, kids have cell phones. We would do a lot of work in refugee camps. Everybody is one step away from a cell phone. Learning how to, how to use that, how to document, being scaffold on that, building those pathways of how to take images, how to express yourself for whatever purposes, what to do with those. I think those programs are what's missing. And those are the building blocks that will be sustainable for long periods of time beyond, like what I see a lot of what you're doing are the gateways to fire the imagination, but then we need these pathways of programs. And I think that's kind of missing in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. We're trying to fill it. 
Yeah, one yeah, question back here. In school, so it's really important to fill that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I can try. <laughs> um, Beth Dembitzer from the New America Foundation. I was just curious, Austin, about your business model. Is the intent to create a platform for visibility or to create an archive that can be used by media? Hmm. Or both? Uh, the honest answer is we don't know. Uh, we are it, sort of in the, th we've just finished this eight week pilot in the Bronx. And so we are getting, once, once my co-founder comes back from Ghana, we're going to sit down with our partners and have a deconstruction of what happened and what worked and what did not work. What we very much want to do is we want this to live on and we want to have programs not just in the Bronx but all over New York City. You know, we've been working in Chicago. We want to continue those partnerships there. We're coming here this fall to partner with the Pulitzer Center and work in, in D.C. We already have the Everyday DC Instagram handle. You can't have it. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, these other everyday projects have sort of happened on their own. And we're trying to find a way to sort of wrap everyone up in one big family and use this documentation as a way of, as a teaching tool. Uh, it is, I, I do feel it's a kind of journalism. I do feel it's a way of uh, telling important stories that aren't being told. But I also really see the value in the ways in which it applies to the classroom. And so far I've told you know, stories about the South Bronx and the South Side of Chicago. I'll also tell you that I have a friend who teaches English literature at Choate in Connecticut. And he called me two weeks ago and said, can I get the prototype address for the, for the website? Because I'm teaching a class and we're uh, a multicultural literature class and this week we're doing African novels. And so I sent him the web address and he called me later that day all excited because in the discussion of these novels that they were reading, he was able to go to the Everyday Africa website and have the kids, you know, click on images of the countries where these books, where the books had been written about, and and learn something about that part of the world, and 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 see that wow, I didn't realize that there were cheerleaders at soccer games in Zimbabwe, and you know, basic stuff like that. So I I think that there's a lot of ways that this really could be applied to the classroom, and, and, and I hope that that can happen. So we are at 3.59, and in an hour, Amy has to catch a train back. All of you, I'm sure, um, are excited to, to recommence the, the task of networking um, and also ending your day. Um, I think this is a really interesting panel to end on. We began asking the question of, in a totally changing media landscape, what does public media mean? What does it mean for media to be public? And we finished talking about um, who tells the stories of the public, um, what the public means, who these stories are told for. We also talked about some of the value that public media um, and that media can provide in addition to what we, uh, we classically think of informing, connecting. Um, there's also archiving and preservation, pr preserving stories to be uh, return to over time. Um, there's also the addition of context, of telling a variety of stories so people can see where any one single story is situated. Um, so I hope that you all have taken away a lot from today. Uh, I, I have. It's been a pleasure participating. Join me, please, in thanking our panelists. And thanks in conclusion to all of you and to our hosts here at the Kaiser Family Foundation and the Media Impact. Thank you. And then I invite them destroying the right, exactly. Throw the weight.